Welcome back everyone. As you can see on the screen, I am diving into the depths yet again. A bunch of you have been telling me that there's another video on the channel Rageaholic, once again addressing the issue of the causes of the American Civil War. And this relates directly to a question that was asked of a presidential candidate about the issue and how she responded and all of that sort of thing. So we're going to dive into this one and I'm going to say a couple of things up front. Uh, as is the case with all of my videos, but especially with this one, uh, it is perfectly acceptable, even welcomed, to disagree. We can disagree. We can even disagree strongly. You can do that without being a jerk. You can do that without insults, without tearing someone down personally. Disagree with their information, disagree with their opinions, and do so with information. That's what I'm going to do today. Anything he says that I call out as being untrue, which if his previous videos are any indication, will happen. We're going to go directly to the sources, go directly to the information. This is not about opinion. This is about what's a fact and what's not. We can disagree on the opinion parts, but we can't state opinions as facts. So with that in mind, I'm also saying this is not an invitation in any way, shape or form to go to his channel and attack him personally. There's a way to go about this, and it's with information, it's with facts, it's with logic. It's not with personal attacks on any side of the issue. So if anybody results, resorts to personal attacks, you'll be blocked and you won't be able to comment on the channel anymore. So there's that. The link is in the description if you want to watch his video without my commentary. I haven't seen it yet. I have no idea what to expect, how it may be different than the previous ones that we've done. Here we go. You may have noticed from the summer of love. Oh, and I should give the family friendly warning here. If you are one of our many viewers who prefers videos to be family friendly, this ain't going to be it. Great big fed cuck circle jerk on the 6th of January. In the aftermath of virtually any event of even the smallest societal significance, Joe Biden's answer is invariably to compare it to the American Civil War. There's an unfolding assault taking place in America today, an attempt to suppress and subvert the right to vote. We're facing the most significant test of our democracy since the Civil War. That's not hyperbole. Since the Civil War. It is hyperbole, but that's another issue. Oh, difference is forgotten, and no need at all to mention the war. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> that's it. What was it again? The prawn cocktail. Oh, prawn, that was it. When you said prawn, I thought you said war. Oh, oh the war. Oh, yes, completely slipped my mind. Yes, I've forgotten all about it. But Biden has an excuse. He was there. What's Nikki Faley's excuse? To be fair, Joe Biden was born closer to Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration than to his own is for taking the most obvious bait this side of a wily e. coyote cartoon. What was the cause of the United States Civil War? Well, don't come with an easy question or anything. I mean, I think the cause of the Civil War was basically how government was going to run, the freedoms and what people could and couldn't do. What do you think the cause of the Civil War was? Awkward moment for everyone involved. I'm, I'm not ready to be president. I, 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 I wanted to see uh, your a good thing. on the cause of the Civil War. I mean, I think it always comes down to the role of government. That said, I couldn't care less about what a person's opinion was on the causes of the Civil War when I'm voting for president. I'm much more concerned about what they think about issues going on today. And what the rights of the people are. And we, I will always stand by the fact that I think government was intended to secure the rights and freedoms of the people. It was never meant to be all things to all people. Government doesn't need to tell you how to live your life. They don't need to tell you what you can and can't do. They don't need to be a part of your life. They need to make sure that you have freedom. We need to have capitalism. We and with that in mind, you can, you can then say that it was the government's right to secure freedom for enslaved people because that is securing the rights of those people have economic freedom. We need to make sure that we do all things so that individuals have the liberties so that they can have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to do or be anything they want to be without government getting in the way. Thank you. And in, in the year 2023, it's astonishing to me that you answer that question without mentioning the word slavery. 
And that's the headline, of course, is that Nikki Haley fails to mention slavery as a cause of the Civil War. What do you want me to say about slavery? No, um, uh, you've answered my question. Thank you. Next question. Cool intro. Now, I touched on this topic last January in an hour-long video essay about the tyrannical record of one Abraham Lincoln, but I'll tell you a secret. The American Civil War bores me about to tears. I find it dry. I find it stuffy. Look, firearms technology hadn't quite entered the cartridge era yet, and as I intimated in the video in question, <laughs> I really don't sympathize with either side of the conflict, and thus the only party left for me to root for is John Wilkes Booth's bullet. But I study it all the same, and for much the same reason I read Pat Buchanan's The Death of the West. Past is I'm not gonna continue to harp on some of his comments like that, but it's very difficult to take seriously anyone who advocates for the murder of a public official of any form. Uh, prologue conspiracy theories are now spoilers and who the hell doesn't want to watch the sneak previews from secession movements to discussion of a draft to violations of the separation of powers so naked hunter biden's getting a foot job from him half the time i read the new york times i have to check if it's a reprint from 1862 but no one jammed a blunderbuss in nikki haley's head hole and demanded she dissemble like the dickens at an obvious question with an even more obvious answer but this speaks to the credibility deficit of this cackling neocon crack whore. Sure, the question was more loaded than an am... Just unnecessary and disrespectful, and I get that this is who he is, this is his personality, but... Again, I have a hard time taking people seriously who are so incredibly disrespectful to people they don't know. Track driver, but if Nikki Haley knew the first thing about the first fucking thing, she could have used the opportunity to educate the public on the difference between the contributive causes of the secession crisis and the civil war itself. Two distinct but interrelated events with distinct, only occasionally interrelated causes. Take this goddamn- Now I'm gonna say this up front because a lot of the comments I got the last time around when I reacted to him had to do with how I was arguing with his points about something and my arguments didn't relate to the title of the video. All I'm doing is reacting to what he says. So he, you know, the title of the video is, Was the Civil War Only About Slavery? And to that I would say, no, it wasn't only about slavery. That's a simple statement with a simple answer. But that's not what he's going to argue here, I'm sure. He's going to get into arguments, if it's anything like his last videos, that say that even secession wasn't about slavery. And that is ridiculous. You can argue about what led to the actual fighting of the war, and the causes on both sides were different for that. So I'm only going to respond to what he says. I'm not only responding to the title of the video here. Goof on Twitter, regurgitating the tiresome refrain of a state's right to what? A vacuous meme that's made the rounds on the interweb of it's late. True, and like all leftist memes, it's distinguished only in its remarkable capacity to make not the faintest bit of butt fucking sense. To which the obvious rejoinder remains a state's right to secede, you world smashing retards. What a revelatory discovery you've uncovered there, Shackleton. Why did they want to secede? That's the question. Why did they want to secede? They didn't want to secede over tariffs. They didn't want to secede because they wanted to start their own country because they thought they could make a cooler flag. They wanted to secede over the right of slavery. And it wasn't even about states' rights. And I'll tell you why. Because they wanted their laws concerning slavery to be enforced in the North, too. They even said that in their secession documents, that it wasn't enough even that they had slavery. They wanted the North to enforce their rules about slavery, too. So they wanted to not only defend their institution, they wanted to take away the state's rights of places like Ohio to do the same. I'd name a landmass in your honor, but where would I find one larger than your goddamn ego? As my Lincoln video happily stated, slavery was most certainly a cause, primarily of the, the secession cause. crisis, particularly the for the states which initially seceded. Of the thir no. 13 states which would ultimately secede just... Oh, time out, time out, time out. 
I know I'm going to sound nitpicky, but if you're going to make arguments about historical facts, you got to get the facts right. There were 11 states that seceded, not 13. Let's count them, shall we? Florida, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. That is 11 states. 11. Now, you, if you want to count other states at the start of the Civil War who also owned slaves, then you have to add Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and that still gets you to 15. Then West Virginia secedes. Just five cited slavery in their much-touted Articles of Secession as a... So he says five touted slavery in the Articles of Secession. So, all right, so I'm going to let him finish this thought, and then we're going to look at the facts causal contributor to the act itself. A significant admission for two reasons. First and foremost, because five ain't even half of 13. Five's incorrect, and the number's 11, not 13. Let's dive into this issue a little deeper. I'm going to do these one by one. This is going to take a little while, but I need to be expertly clear that there's no doubt on any of these things. Okay, so let's start with South Carolina, the first state to secede. Uh, their secession reasons were given, and to summarize all of them, non-slaveholding states have denied the rights of property legal in slave states, i.e. slaves. Non-slaveholding states have denounced slavery as sinful. Non-slaveholding states have allowed abolitionist organizations to be created and exist in their jurisdictions. South Carolina gave as a reason for seceding that states like New York and Ohio had abolitionist organizations that they allowed to exist in their states. So much for states' rights, huh? Non-slaveholding states have encouraged and assisted slaves to escape slavery. Non-slaveholding states have, states have incited servile insurrection. Isn't it interesting that South Carolina had an issue with people starting an insurrection in their states? Fascinating. All right, so that's South Carolina. There's a table here that actually goes over those things, stuff like that. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to Mississippi. Uh, so Mississippi was super clear about their causes. Uh, that we do not overstate the dangers to our institution, meaning slavery. Uh, it talks all about uh, hostility toward the fugitive slave law. Uh, again, dealing with all of this stuff over and over and over and over again. Uh, no, talks about nullifying the fugitive slave law, advocating Negro equality so socially and politically, promoting insurrectionism. Uh, enlisting its press, meaning the North, its pulpit, and its schools against us uh, until the North is excited and inflamed with prejudice about slavery. So again, they've got a problem with people saying and doing things in other states. So much for states' rights. So that's Mississippi. And again, here's a, a specific table that mentions all the reasons that they go over and what they have to do with various things. So uh, Florida, let's go on to them. They talk about instigating John Brown's raid. Uh, they talk about passing laws that impeded the enforcement of fugitive slave laws. They talk about Congress being turned into a daily denunciation of the slaveholding states, published and circulated books intended to excite uh, insurrection and servile war. A president was elected with a settled and often proclaimed hostility to their institutions, uh, intent on blocking new slaveholding states, which are carved out of the territory. So in other words, the prevention of expansion of slavery. Uh, so again, Florida, super clear. That's three. Now, Alabama is one of the ones that he would argue did not mention slavery in their secession document. And that's not true because their secession document opens up with these words, whereas the election of Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin to the offices of president and vice president of the United States of America by a sectional party avowed hostile to the domestic institutions uh, and to the peace and security of the people of Alabama. And the reason they're saying whereas is because 10 months earlier, Alabama had passed an ordinance that said that if Lincoln or any Republican were elected president, they would act on that by seceding. So what they're doing now with their act of secession is referring back to the document passed 
on February 24, 1860, by the Alabama General Assembly that passed a joint resolution that said that if this happens, we're gone, we're seceding. And in that document, they over and over again referred to slavery as the institution that they needed to protect. They talk about contempt for obligations of law and the sanctity of compacts when it comes to the fugitive slave law, a deadly hostility to the rights and institutions of the Southern people, a settled purpose to the effect of overthrowing the rights of the institutions of the Southern people. Over and over and over again, and it says, whereas anti-slavery agitation persistently continued in the non-slaveholding states of this union, so again, their secession document directly connects itself to what they passed earlier, which over and over again mentions slavery. And it's a follow-up saying, now we're following through on what we previously said would happen. So that's four for four. Georgia, number five. The people of Georgia, having dissolved their political connection with the government of the United States of America, present to their confederates and the world the causes which have led to the separation. They're making a direct connection to the Declaration of Independence with their wording there. For the last 10 years, we have had numerous and serious causes of complaint against our non-slaveholding confederate states with reference to the subject of African slavery. That's five for five. And for the record, with Georgia, they go on a lot more. I'm just showing at least in each state at least one reference to slavery just to debunk this idea that the majority of states in the South never mention slavery as even a cause. Okay, We could go a whole lot deeper and talk about how many times they mentioned it and how much of their document, because what it ends up being is about 98% of all of the causes given by all of the states reference slavery directly. All right, so we're on to Louisiana. And Louisiana is another one of those ones that people argue does not mention slavery in its reasons for secession. Uh, so here, uh, Louisiana secedes on January 26th, 1861. Um, they did not leave any document. So it's not like they left a document that gave a bunch of causes that just didn't mention slavery. And this is the case with a lot of these states that people say don't mention slavery. They just didn't mention anything in their causes. But we can look at other acts taken by the Louisiana Convention and by their legislature that do show what their motivations were. Uh, and in this case... Um, there's something you have to understand. There's something called the Crittenden Compromise that would have passed a slew of constitutional amendments that would have not only uh, enshrined slavery in the Constitution and protected it, but also protected the expansion of slavery to new states. And Louisiana got behind these. A ban on abolishing slavery uh, uh, on federal property within a slave state. A ban on abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia. Uh, an affirmation of the interstate slave trade, uh, a payment for fugitive slaves. No future amendment can ever empower Congress to interfere with slavery, uh, which I don't know how on earth you could possibly pass an amendment that says that, because you can always repeal an amendment and change it. Um, an affirmation of constitutionality of fugitive slave laws, the un constitutionality of state laws impeding fugitive slave laws again in other words we want the right to prevent states rights in the north uh, so again louisiana backed all of this stuff so even though they left no document of their own so you can't argue they gave causes that didn't mention slavery they just didn't give causes but they made it clear that these were the things that needed to happen in order to stay in the union Texas is another one that made it abundantly clear what they were talking about uh, in their Declaration of Causes, which impelled the state of Texas to secede from the Federal Union. Uh, and I'm not going to read all of these, but over and over and over again, they reference uh, their grievances with non-slaveholding states and with the uh, attacks on the institution of slavery. They make it abundantly clear. And you can look at this table um, the only thing that they mention in theirs that doesn't have to do with slavery at all has to do with failing to protect the lives and property of people of Texas against Indian savages and murderous forays of bandits from Mexico. Everything else has directly to do with slavery. So with Texas, again, I don't think even he would argue that they mentioned that as their cause for uh, secession. So let's move on to Arkansas now. 
So Arkansas is pretty straightforward. Uh, they were one of the late ones to secede much later on. There's a big gap between kind of the initial deep south and then the other states who secede later a little further north. Arkansas, resolutions of March 11th, 1861. They talk about denying the right of property, specifically slaves. They talk about slavery being denounced as sinful as a cause, about allowing abolitionist organizations to exist about encouraging assisted slaves to escape slavery, inciting servile resurrection, and electing Lincoln, who is anti-slavery. That's Arkansas. In the cases of Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, again, we don't have any clear document that's given that lays out a bunch of information about slavery being the cause or not being the cause. Uh, but in all three cases, they sent delegates to a peace conference whose sole purpose was to protect the institution of slavery and to get a bunch of amendments passed that would prevent the federal government from dealing with slavery, not only where it already existed, but also from preventing its expansion into other territories. That was the only reason that conference existed. It wasn't there to deal with issues of tariffs. It wasn't there to argue about states' rights. It was there to argue about the protection of slavery. Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee all sent delegates to the, that conference, same delegates who would then represent Virginia in the secession, uh, conventions later on. So there's a clear uh, connection there. Honestly, of the 11, not 13, of the 11 states, only one of them gave a official document that presented reasons for secession that did not explicitly over and over and over again mention slavery. Only one. Now, let's fast forward a little bit because all 11 of those states then join the Confederate States of America, which passes its own constitution, which all 11 states signed on to. And in that constitution, uh, it uses the word slaves, unlike the U.S. Constitution. It accounted for enslaved people as three-fifths of a state population, like the U.S. Constitution. And it required by law that any new territory that was added to the Confederacy must allow slavery. And over and over again, it enshrines slavery into the Confederate Constitution. So they all signed on to that. They all signed on to a nation which made that mandatory. You couldn't join the Confederacy as a, a free state. That wasn't even an option. You must permit slavery as a free state. So much for states' rights. All right. I've done enough. We could go a lot deeper into this issue, but the point being it wasn't 13 states, it was 11, and it wasn't only five of them who argued that slavery was a direct cause for, for their secession. If 13 people died, five of the flu, and the remaining eight from goddamn gunshot wounds, no sane person is going to say 13 people died of the fucking flu. That would be what the bard would call a fucking lie, you leery. That is a ridiculous and pointless argument. That doesn't even have anything to do with anytime we make these comparisons like that, it's apples and oranges. Shit smear. Secondly, it predictably fails to concede why slavery was mentioned in those seceding documents. To repeatedly protest federal regulation or allowance of the institution. Hence, their rejection of the Corwin Amendment, which would have rendered the institution permanent it's an ugly because again that was not the issue the corwin amendment would have protected slavery where it already existed they weren't seceding because they thought that the federal government was about to outlaw slavery where it already existed they were seceding because the republican party as a party and lincoln as a candidate opposed the expansion of slavery to new states that might be admitted to the union and that to southern states was the same as abolishing slavery because eventually new states that would be added that would be free states would add to to the imbalance of power to where more and more senators more and more congressmen would be coming from free states and eventually there would be enough power in the north to outlaw slavery in the country so this was a preemptive strike against that 
by saying we're out because the expan the end of expansion of slavery means the eventual death of slavery itself, even if it's 20 or 30 years from now. So the Corwin Amendment didn't solve the problem because it didn't protect the expansion of slavery. That's why it matters. Ugly fact of fucking history, but some people were property at the time, and thus it's awful tough to complain about federal overregulation and taxation of commerce without mentioning slavery. Sadly, one of the primary engines of commerce. So now he's saying it was really an economic issue, and slaves just happened to be one of the economic issues. Well, then how come they didn't mention all kinds of other things? I didn't see any mentions of tariffs in any of those secession documents. At that time, and yes, which, by the way, 90 percent of the federal income for tariffs came through the north anyway. Friends, that means in order for defenders of Lincoln to argue that the Civil War was fought only over slavery, they must first necessarily. I've never heard anybody say it was only over slavery. We're just saying that here's the thing. If slavery doesn't exist, there is no secession in 1860. Tell me that about any other single issue. Take away any of the other issues. Does secession still happen? No. Slavery is the only issue on which secession was going to happen. So say, say slavery had been abolished 30 years before that. We're not even having this conversation. That's why it is the, the factor. Necessarily concede that the entire war was in fact fought over economics <gasps> you can somewhat sell the slavery caused the secession crisis argument at least to the abject ignorant but it's a tough road to hoe arguing fort sumter was about slavery when there was nary a slave in the fucking thing and not a single casualty resulted even if there were but the fact remains the confederates time out there were casualties they didn't happen during the fighting itself they happened afterwards but there were casualties there were people who died as a result of fort sumter um a couple of Union soldiers died from an exploding cannon during the surrender ceremony, but that's a separate issue and that doesn't really matter. No, what happened there was that a federal fort that was federal property and manned by federal troops, and they hadn't turned it over. So South Carolina deciding that they are no longer part of the Union doesn't mean that they suddenly get to own all the federal property that exists inside their state. Uh, it would be like if my county decided tomorrow that they didn't want to be a part of Ohio anymore. And we have an Ohio National Guard armory in our county. We can't just say, well, it's ours now. That's not how it works. That's state property. State property isn't county property. Federal property was federal property. And they were trying to resupply the troops that were otherwise going to starve. And they were fired on because they wouldn't surrender. So... Yeah, first shots were fired by the South. Secession and the Civil War are two separate events with their own unique, if occasionally related, causes. And the fact that the modern revisionist narrative requires the conflation of those two it's is- It's not modern. All right, so we can argue that the war itself was fought for different reasons than secession. The South seceded over slavery. Let's not kid ourselves about anything else. Any other argument is disingenuous, ridiculous, and requires mental gymnastics that I don't even understand why it's so important for people to try and argue that what was obvious to everybody at the time is suddenly, the only revision that's going on here is the revisionist history after the fact that people wanted to, in the lost cause narrative, argue that it was about something other than slavery. Now, you can argue that Lincoln wasn't fighting over slavery. He wasn't. He raised troops to put down a rebellion, a rebellion that started because of secession over slavery. So I guess if you want to make comparisons, because we like our comparisons, people point to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand as the cause of the, uh, the First World War. Were there other reasons? Yeah, there were a whole ton of other things. There were alliances and all this other stuff like that. But you take away the assassination, no war happens in the summer of 1914. Now, maybe a war happens down the road because of some other issue. But you take away the assassination, there's no war. You take away slavery, there's no war. That's the truth. Prime indicia that their arguments are ass over tea kettle awful. My follow-up to the original Lincoln video has been 
sort of broiling on the back burner for some time, but for the purposes of addressing the idiocy espoused by the team of trained orangutans that handle the Twitter account of the Chester-in-Chief, how not about slavery was the Civil War itself? Well, I mentioned Lincoln refusing to treat with a Confederate Peace Commission early on when things weren't looking so hot for the Union. What I plan to mention in the follow-up video is that a separate Confederate Peace Commission was dispatched late in the war, with the Union now firmly assuming a victor's posture. And this time, Stinkin' Lincoln agreed. On the Union side were Lincoln himself and Secretary of State Seward. And perhaps one of the reasons he actually agreed to meet this time is that the head of the Confederate Commission was lifelong Lincoln ally and Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens, whose association with the dictator-in-chief dated back to when they were both members of the Whig Party. Now, Stevens is a name... Yeah, they, they were in Congress, I think, for one term together. ...hear often from the Armchair Intelligentsia on History YouTube as one of his most famous quotations amounted to an impassioned defense of slavery. The cornerstone speech. In the Confederacy, this being the smoking gun the statists wield whenever any counter-argument about slavery is a driver of the... So <laughs> So basically his argument is every time I try and make my ridiculous argument that secession wasn't about slavery, people pull out this vice president of the Confederacy that blatantly and obviously made it abundantly clear that the Confederacy was built on the cornerstone of slavery. And then he dismisses it as though somehow, oh yeah, there they go again with that ridiculous argument. There's a reason why people bring it up. War is proper. And here's what I don't understand. In his previous videos, over and over and over again, in making his argument that Abraham Lincoln was a dictator, goes back and pulls quotes from Lincoln's speeches 20 years before he became president to show what Lincoln's attitudes were about specific issues. Why, then, are we to dismiss the vice president of the Confederacy's cornerstone speech? Which is hilarious when you really think about it, as this gaggle of goddamn idiots are essentially arguing that the South fought for slavery because of the words of one of Abraham Lincoln's closest allies in professional politics, a former member of his party. And That's irrelevant. They were in the same party together. Guess what? They were also in the same country together. They were in the same Congress together. Jefferson Davis was a United States senator. So if we're going to argue that point, Jeff Davis was, he was a U.S. Senator. He was Secretary of War. He was in the federal government, too. One of the Confederate generals was Vice President of the United States when secession happened. None of that means anything. Who cares if they were in the same party? It doesn't change what Stevens said. And a man who, to that point, shared virtually all of Abraham Lincoln's political positions. So what? Okay. Now, what does that have to do with your point that secession wasn't about slavery? The reason I mention this meeting is that it's elucidated by eyewitness testimony in Paul Escott's amazingly titled book, What Shall We Do With the Negro? <laughs> And whether you're arguing slavery started the Civil War or merely became a convenient reason for the war later on, this politically incorrect tome should prove an illuminating read indeed. During said meeting, not only did Lincoln describe the Emancipation Proclamation as, and I quote, a war measure only, and like it, any war me it was. measure would be null and void upon the conflict's conclusion, but... That's absolutely true, which is why by the time this meeting happened, they were already pushing through the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. Lincoln, at that point, had to make the war about something. 600,000 people died. At this point, it was about transforming the nation, okay? Because the South was defeated, now the North was in a position to dictate the peace. And heck yeah, they were going to say, we're going to remove slavery. We're taking this off the table, so we're not fighting this war again 20 years from now. Because the entire history of the United States to this point had been centered around that issue of kicking the can down the road on the issue of slavery. It was compromise after compromise. It was, it was going back and forth on what do we do, and nobody was ever solving the issue. So heck yeah, they were going to solve the issue now that they had the opportunity. And heck yeah, they were going to require that any resolution to the war at that point 
also involve a permanent solution to the issue of slavery. We're not going down this road again. But once the subject of the new 14th Amendment, not the Corwin Amendment, the one that, unlike Lincoln, actually freed the slaves was broached, Abraham... The 13th Amendment freed the slaves. The 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is the one he's referring to here, which is not about ending slavery. Lincoln tables an offer to the Confederacy. It's Let's go into this a little further. Because the 14th Amendment is not even ratified till 1868. So this has nothing to do with Lincoln. You know, this is happening later on. This is Andrew Johnson and then... Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, our president, when the 14th and 15th Amendments are going to be passed. So this has to do with citizenship for the freed slaves. So um, all persons born or naturalized in the United States or subject to its uh, jurisdiction are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens. And this goes directly back to before the Civil War, the Dred Scott decision, which held in part that, that slaves and freed slaves and black people in particular were not subject to the rights of citizenship. So this was making sure that citizenship applied to anybody born in this country, no matter what their race was or, or anything else. So, uh, and then it also allows for the right to vote. Uh, in the case, in this case, for males who are 21 years of age or older. So I don't know why he's talking about the 14th Amendment. I'm, I'm sure he means the 13th Amendment, which is the one that outlawed slavery. Clear he put considerable time into crafting. If the South will consent to return to the Union, he argues, then if for no other reason than sheer force of numbers, the 14th Amendment would be mathematically guaranteed to fail to pass. I repeat, if Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, got his way in this meeting with the Confederate Peace Commission, not a single slave would have been freed. That's not true because by the time he met with this Peace Commission, again, we're talking about the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment was already being ratified in enough Southern states that it was gonna be uh, passed. Tennessee, Louisiana, and Arkansas. We're already working to pass it. So I, I'm not sure what he's getting at here because that is absolutely not true. First of all, he's talking about the wrong amendment. Second of all, the votes were there. Even if all of the Southern states were readmitted to the Union, there were enough Southern states that were going to ratify the 13th Amendment that it was going to become law regardless. So wait. If the Civil War was so this is only wrong. for the this South is absolutely slavery, factually Abraham incorrect. Lincoln presented it a proposal that would have protected it explicitly, why didn't the South accept? It's almost as if it left unaddressed the paramount concern of the Confederacy, that the federal government... The expansion of slavery. ...should allow sovereign states to regulate their own economies, trade with their own allies, and in essence to govern themselves without the say-so of the federal fucking government. A fact the Confederate Constitution ties a great big bow on by outright banning protective tariffs of any kind. Hell, half the time... The well, nobody's arguing that the South had a problem with tariffs. That's absolutely the case. They didn't secede over tariffs. Tariffs aren't mentioned once in, once in any of those secession documents. They're not. A Lincoln if that was the issue, that should have been front and center, not slavery, which is mentioned over and over and over and over and over again in those documents. Attempt to prove their premise, they only accomplish the exact opposite, such as when Lincoln scholar Doris Goodwin, very much a believer in the Honest Abe myth, half acidly attempted to prove Lincoln was only vaguely aware of the Corwin Amendment. <laughs> you know, again. Doris Kearns Goodwin has more knowledge of actual history and her little pinky than you will, you or I will ever have in our entire lifetimes. And the one I mentioned would have made slavery permanent ahead of the Civil War only for her to unwittingly uncover primary documents in the form of personal correspondence that Abraham Lincoln was, in fact, one of the primary authors yeah. of the fucking Corwin Amendment, a fact that becomes particularly interesting... Because Lincoln was not attempting to abolish slavery. He was attempting to prevent it from expansion to new territories. That was the whole Republican Party premise in the election of 1860. So, yeah... 
that shows that Lincoln was not the tyrant you think he is. Because if Lincoln was the tyrant you claim he is, then he would have jumped all over the secession crisis to be able to march down south with his armies and end slavery. Instead, he tried to find a compromise that kept things in the status quo. He considered that in his first inaugural address, Lincoln lied his ass off, claiming he had only recently heard of the Corwin Amendment's existence. <laughs> Honest Abe, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on. Interesting that he leaves out the rest of the text of Lincoln's uh, first inaugural here. He says, I understand a proposed amendment to the Constitution, which amendment, however, I've not seen. And what he means there is he just hasn't seen the exact wording of it. He hasn't actually looked at the text of the amendment. He has, however, been told what it says. He says, has passed Congress to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the domestic institution of the states, including that of persons held to service. Holding such a provision to now be implied constitutional law, I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. So what he's saying is, I haven't read the text of the document, but I understand this is what it says. And basically what he's saying is, all it does is acknowledge what I already believe to be constitutional law already. And I have no problem with that. So be honest about what he actually said. If you wondered why her fawning book, Team of Rivals, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln, was one of the primary sources of my last Lincoln video, now you know, numbnuts. Even pro-Lincoln lies are worth reading, as they eagerly and often disprove them fucking selves. Which brings us to the bullshit at present. I mean, you know Nikki Dunn stepped in it when even the brain drain trust that operates Biden's Twitter account got in more dunks than an NBA Jam arcade cabinet. Look, do I need Nikki Haley to have known any of this shit? Not necessarily. I wish I didn't fucking know it. Though any extrapolation on the subject might have proven profoundly instructive and helpful in an era where no shit, Civil War era reconciliation monuments are being bulldozed amid an atmosphere of regional antipathy approaching levels not seen since the 18 fucking 50s. Rocket attacks in Gaza, talk a civil war at home, and let's not forget the legendary limping away from Afghanistan. Who knew returning to... So it looks like he's pretty much done with the topic now at hand, so I'm going to leave it right there. If you have questions about anything specifically or want me to explain something even more, glad to do it in the comment section. Again, not going to tolerate uh, being uncivil toward one another. Disagree. Disagree strongly. Provide documentation for what you are arguing. Uh, and if you do post a link, understand that it won't show up right away because I have to approve links. It's a preventative measure. Uh, from spam. Uh, if any, if you've ever had a YouTube channel, people come on and spam and post all kinds of like porn links and stuff like that. So to prevent that, you have to filter out anything posted with a link. So I will approve it if it's a link to some documentation of some kind. Uh, so don't think I'm trying to like hide things or anything like that. Let's have a conversation about this, but do so in a way that's civil without insulting one another, without attacking one another personally. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you found it helpful. Do your research, read about this stuff, learn for yourself. Don't take anybody's opinion for it on YouTube. Learn the facts, make your own conclusions from that. Thanks for watching.